mind brain identity theory. Okay, now, what exactly is mind brain identity theory? Um, the exact. <laughs> Back and forth. I, I gotta figure out what you can do with this. But uh, you're not walking back and forth. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Now, at this point in the semester, we're coming up on things that are more or less current issues, where there are philosophers on both sides of the fence, and. Um, I'm not going to say that there are reasonable arguments on both sides, but there are people who have tenure track jobs who hold both sides. That is, there are people with, who are paid to do philosophy on both sides of the issue. Um, quite a lot on each side. And so I'm going to be treating this last module as a set of pretty much current issues, because they're close to current. So this is an issue that's perhaps even now being thought out in the journals. Um, and right now, it's, um, it, it's important to get the definition of the theory exactly right, because this theory is going to um, have to deal with criticism. And one of the defenses against, possible defenses against some kind of criticism is, hey, you guys, you didn't get the theory right. And I told you the story of Einstein's theory of, rel uh, rel of relativity. Uh, when Einstein came out with his theory of relativity and published it, a whole bunch of other people, including a bunch of philosophers, published papers saying, oh, no, Einstein's got to be wrong, because his theory says blah, 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 and that we know is wrong because of blah, blah, blah. And Einstein had to write a series of papers pointing out to other people that they had not correctly understood what he was saying. So he'd write a paper saying, Professor so-and-so says my theory says blah, 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 blah. But if you look at the wording I used, I say blah, 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 and that means this and this and this. So Professor So-and-so's objection doesn't count, which is a polite way of saying Professor So-and-so has his head up his butt. But um, I want to focus on the logical thing of you can't knock down a theory unless you really understand what exactly what it's saying. And if you make an objection to a theory that changes the meaning of parts of the definition, um, then your objection is crap. You have to knock down the theory exactly as the writer wrote it, not some bizarre other world version that makes sense only to you. So what exactly is my brain identity theory saying? But I'm not going to say exactly right now. I'm going to say it as close as I can, and we'll refine the definition as we go along, if we have to. Well, maybe I'll get it right the first time. Miracles have happened. Mind-brain identity theory. Yeah. Every time you your mind does something or something happens in your mind, that is your experience of a brain event. 
or you could say consciousness, is our experience of brain events. So if, if you ever had something to say but you couldn't quite figure out the right words to put it in, right? you know, you're trying to you're trying to communicate something to someone but you just can't think of the right word. That feeling of having the right, having an idea, but not knowing what uh, word to put on it, is your feeling of your experience of Broca's and Wernicke's areas here, looking for the, camera, the speech centers. Right? You've got the speech center up on the side of the brain. Um, recognizing an idea as a data pattern, an information pattern, or a pattern of neuron firings working over here and trying to find the right vocabulary to express that. So it's a brain process. Finding the right word to express your present thought is a brain process and you experience it as a mind process. So having some, a word on the tip of your tongue, it's a brain event. Similarly, volitions. If I was to say suddenly have, uh, suddenly have the impulse to pick up this coffee cup and fling it out into the classroom, that would be a brain event. That would be my experience of a brain event. If I suppress it, feeling that I've suppressed uh, an impulse is my experience of another set of brain events. Um, have you ever just sort of done something without thinking about it? Like you just you're at the refrigerator and you just reach out and go get a beer and you're walking down the hall. You know, I didn't even think about this. I just reached in and got a beer without thinking. Cool. That's called uh, a volition, the thing you do. And the brain part of that, the mind part of that is called a volition and that's a brain event too. Your brain makes your mind. Brain makes mind. In a sense, your brain is you. Um, there was a TV show last night where the main character was a schizophrenic, and actually, this is a great example. Um, he was schizophrenic. He had a schizophrenic break, uh, a psychotic break, when he saw his sister being raped, and afterwards, he carried out he. Um, he was on meds for a while, then the meds stopped working, he was on different meds, and those meds were killing him mentally. He said it was like swinging through wet cement. So in office med meds, he went psychopathic, uh, he kidnapped and attacked uh, young girls under the delusion that he was saving his sister from rapists. And then when he put, was put back on the meds, when he was put back on the meds, he realized what he had done and wanted to kill himself. Now all of those, under this theory, all of those things are brain events, are things that are created by this biological machinery you've got between your ears. And um, everything, the volition to kill himself, that's a brain event. The <laughs> you see that? You, you went behind the camera and you had to sit down at the desk and then get outside at the other side of the desk. Um, they're all brain events. The thing of the, of the uh, psychotic break where you start, <laughs> <laughs> you start attacking people, and then the thing of him wanting to kill himself afterwards. All done by the brain, according to this theory. Now, I need a different color. Here's a different color. <laughs> Argument for Kimbit. Mind, brain, identity theory. The bit. Okay. Now, in the book, they have this really they have this really, 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 really lame argument for mind-brain identity theory. 
Oh, I just don't see how sensations could be left outside the physical picture. Um, that's sort of a pale shadow of a real argument for mind-brain identity theory. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this down as a set of bullet points. <coughs> And the first bullet point is um, sensation of trying to find the right words to express your thought. I just had that one. And it was a brain event. <laughs> Altering someone's brain alters that person's mind. If you make a change to someone's brain, you tend to make a change to that person's mind. Um, many mental disorders, such as schizophrenia, and um, uh, Euler's de Torres syndrome, have been shown to be physiologically based. That is, you alter the physiology, you alter the mental activity. Um, Lots and lots of people. Uh, the, the psychopharmacology is based on this uh, insight. Alter the brain, you alter the mind. And people go to doctors to get chemicals to alter their brains in order to alter their minds. If you don't like the way your mind is working, one thing you can do is get someone to give you a way of chemically altering it. Perfect, they have side effects. There's a lot of people um, benefit from them. There are a lot of people who believe their lives have been saved by Prozac. A lot of people who swear by Zoloft. Um, also, physical damage to the brain alters the mind. This can be pretty superficial in the sense that if you have damage to your striate cortex, back here, you will have damage to your visual field. You will um, not be able to see in the same way. You can have a scotoma, which is a gap in your visual field. So a physical change here means a change in your experience. And your visual field is part of your mind. Um, if you have lesion in Broca's or Wernicke's area, which handles syntax and semantics, and that kind of stuff, and I'm not really sure how, how they're different. Um, you get what's called aphasia, which is an inability to command some part of language. And the sort of Broca's aphasia and Wernicke's aphasia, um, where uh, some people have trouble with syntax, some people have trouble with what words mean. Um, apparently, they get very good at interpreting paralanguage. So, and paralanguage, interpreting bodily gestures and things. Uh, people with, uh, I think it's Asperger's syndrome, where they can't pick up social cues. You know, and their friends just think they're assholes. But no, they're just some, there's a part of the information that isn't going through. And you may notice some of your friends are slightly clueless about various things. I have people I know where I just can't get through to them on certain things. Um, 
So sometimes, you know, sometimes they just ask. But sometimes they got uh, aphasia or Asperger's or, or, or mild autism or some something wrong with the brain function. So the, everything you do with your mind, but one way to look at this is to say that your mind is something you do, and your brain is the organ by which you do it. So just like using the arm, use the arm to throw things, manipulate things, make expressive gestures, um, you use your brain to make that mind, to do all those mental functions which you need in order to have a good life, or whatever it is you do. So, um, so, and this is very, very strong evidence. This is incredibly strong evidence. Um, at least I think so. Okay, what's the other part of the argument? physical explanations turn out to be crap. Um, we went through Descartes. Descartes had what appeared to be a strong contender uh, against mind-brain identity theory. There is this other thing called mind, which is off in the distance, floating out there, an immaterial substance that has absolutely no uh, properties in common with physical substance. Um, the problem with that, the problem with any non-physical explanation of mind, is how does this non-physical mind influence um, the physical body? This is called the mind-body problem, which, as I said before, is a problem for, my, uh, for Cartesian dualism the way an imminent nuclear explosion is a problem for a bunny rabbit sitting on the casing of the bomb. You know, if the bomb goes off, the bunny rabbit has a problem. Um, so, the brain, that the brain is the only reasonable explanation for the mind. You know, the answer is, if it's not the brain, what the hell is it? And we just get ludicrous stuff that turns out to be ludicrous. And incidentally, this thing of altering consciousness by altering the brain decisively refutes Cartesian dualism, decisively refutes any non-physical explanation uh, for the mind, because if the mind isn't physical, how can physical damage to the, to the brain alter the way the mind works. And it alters it in the deepest possible way. Um, Finney, have you ever, you've heard of Phineas Gage? He's the guy who took a tamping rod through the head. Tamping rod is like a big honking piece of rebar, big long metal bar. And the damn thing went through his head like this. In through the top, out through the bottom. Um, and uh, it changed him. It changed him in a very interesting way, actually, because it did not remove any mental function, any cognitive function, in terms of being able to do logic, being able to do his, law, uh, his job. He did not become mentally handicapped because of this. But he turned mean. Before the tamping rod, he was a nice guy. After the tamping rod, after he'd recovered, after he'd physically recovered from the injury, his personality was still different. He wasn't in pain, he wasn't resentful, he just lost the ability to be nice. And the most reasonable explanation for this is that this tamping rod took out a piece of his 
uh, his brain, took out the piece of the brain that gave him the ability to be nice to people. Okay. So, any questions? Okay. Sure. Now, uh, now, of course, doing this kind of thing, covering current issues, it's very, very, very important for me to present both sides of the issue in a completely fair and unbiased manner. So, I'm going to be totally impartial as I discuss Chavez's stupid objection. Now, Schaffer's stupid objection. Ooh, guess who forgot to bring his uh, textbook? All right, I'm going to do this from memory. <laughs> uh, Schaffer's stupid objection goes like this. Um, According to Schaffer, two things are identical, and what you say about one is also true of the other. Um, now, there used to be a dispute about the relationship between the morning star and the evening star. The morning star is a bright light that is seen in, near the horizon in the evening. The The morning star is a bright light seen in the morning. The evening star is a bright light seen during the evening. I hope that's the way it was. It would be kind of weird if it was the other way around. Good morning. Oh, look, there's the evening star. Now, uh, the morning star. And eventually they worked out that, hey, they're both the same thing. So instead of saying the morning star, we say, hey, there's Venus. Doesn't it look bright this morning? And then in the evening we say, hey, there's Venus. Doesn't it look bright this evening? I don't know if they'd really be in different directions. I'm very, very weak in astronomy. So the morning star is the evening star is the planet Venus. So if I say the morning star is X million miles from the sun, that means it has to be true that the evening star is X million miles from the sun, and the planet Venus is also X million miles from the sun. They all have to be the same. It has to be the same for everyone. Uh, the morning star is hot and dry with a very thin atmosphere. So the evening star has to be hot and dry with a very thin atmosphere. So if you look at the morning star and you look at the evening star, at the same time, you'll see the same properties. And if you look at Venus, at the same time you're looking at uh, the morning star, you'll get the same properties. The things that are true of the morning star are true of the evening star. Now, take the but take brain events and mind events. Brain events and mind events don't have this relationship. Uh, 
Um, you know that feeling, ooh, I screwed up? Like, wait a moment, I just said the morning star appears in the evening. Like that. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Okay. Under learning brain identity theory, some neuron stuff accounts for my uh oh feeling. So, you know, if you've ever had if you've ever had that uh oh feeling, then according to mind brain identity theory, there was a certain cascade of neural firings in your brain. There was a, it's a complicated neurological event linked to other neurological events. So you can sort of look here and thing, and you could sort of diagram it, if you have pictures of neurons and things, you can imagine the sort of spider web of lit up, lit up lights and things like Christmas lights and stuff. You've seen the films of the neurons and things firing. It's freaky and scary and stuff. Right? And according to uh, Schaffer, um, The neuron stuff has size, shape, creepiness, I don't know. Um, Any neurological event has this neuron fires, which triggers these neurons, but inhibits those neurons. And the ones that fire activate, some, uh, excite some neurons and uh, suppress others. And the ones that are excited may or may not fight, depending on fire, based on what's coming in at the time. It's all horrendously complicated. Right? You've got horrendously complicated uh, brain events, and you get, uh oh. So, okay. so I want you to imagine that I have some really big neurons linked together and I fire these off in the pattern for the optimal experience and you see Blip, 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 you know, a wave of firing goes through. And then I say, okay, look at that. Wasn't that embarrassing? Wasn't that a little uncomfortable? Didn't that sort of, you know, throw you for a loop? Didn't that give you that what do I do now feeling? How do I fix this feeling? And you look at me like I'm a complete moron, because obviously this ensemble of neurological firings has nothing to do with that. It has none of those properties. Um, but then I say, well, here's your, imagine, examine your up old feeling. Um, how big was it? Um, what shape was it? What sequence did it come in? And you go, well, what the hell are you talking about? I just felt this feeling. It was a, you know, and I can, I can say what it was like. It's sort of like falling. When I, um, when I examine that closely, it's almost like the ground's fallen away from me just a tiny little bit. And you'd have whatever. Okay. Did the neurological stuff fall? Did it go up and down? There's no properties in common. So Schaffer says it is absurd to say that that's a brain event. Mind events and brain cannot be identical because they can't be identical. This is what identical means. The morning star is, is the evening star of Venus. Right. 
So uh, the morning star, um, right, for instance, the morning star appears mornings. Which, um, which is absolutely identical, with exactly the same property as the evening star, which appears awake. Which, um, is the evening star is Venus. You go, go back to when the morning star traveled, if you will, in your mind, back to a distant time before people realized the morning star was the evening star. Where was Venus? Oh, I know where Venus was. Venus was only seen late at night. So, how does this work? What's going on? Why is there this identity problem? Well, here's a story. Common folk not particularly interested in astronomy. They don't really care about it. They get up in the morning uh, and they see the morning star and they go about their work. <coughs> And then they go to bed in the evening, and they go back home in the evening, and they'll see the evening star, sometimes. So there's a star in the morning and a star in the evening. Do they watch this star climb in the sky, become identified as Venus, then decline, and then in the morning, the morning brighten up again? No, they go home to bed because they're really tired. They've been working all day. Right? The people who know about the planet Venus are rich people who have the leisure time to do astronomy. So the morning star is the folk name for a bright, that bright light that appears in the morning. And the evening star is a folk name. It's not a name for the planet Venus, which is something astronomers know. So we have two different vocabularies, the vocabulary of the common folk and the vocabulary of the, vocabulary of the scientists. Is the morning star the evening star? Look, there's the evening star, but it's morning, so that's the morning star. Yes, but we're experiencing the evening star right now. When you see the morning star, are you seeing the evening star? No, you're not, because the evening star is the name for the bright light you see in the evening. When you see the morning star, do you see Venus? Actually, you don't, because the planet Venus, the big ball of rock with the dry, thin atmosphere and the heat and I don't know, ammonia or whatever it is that's on the damn place, I've forgotten what it's like. I've forgotten what it's like on Venus. Um, that's the explanation for this. Look, there's the morning star. It's X million miles from the sun. How do you know that? Well, look. Look, the sun is over there, out of sight. Because it's like very early in the morning, the sun hasn't come up. Look, can't you see that X million miles apart? Okay. How many of you have seen a bright light in the sky and look at it and go, hmm, that's 45 million miles from the sun. <laughs> Does anyone experience that? 